All right. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, we still have people joining us as, as we speak right now. So we're gonna wait for another few seconds before we start um, the webcast. Happy Thursday, everyone. Okay, so um, yes, good, good, uh, good morning. Um, depends on the time zone. I've seen there's there's a lot of people joining from the U.S., but I've seen also other people coming from from Europe. I guess that's that's just because of Safir here, uh, who's been a, this uh, international guy. Um, so very excited to have everyone uh, joining us today for the webcast. We had a lot of uh, people attending. Say they would attend on LinkedIn. So we'll see. Um, you know, what's the turnout? Uh, looks like we, ha we have around more than 100 people right now uh, with us. Um, so a couple of things. So first of all, uh, for the ones that are um, coming here for the first time, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Eric Caldener. I'm the uh, CEO of Kinestry. And uh, Kinestry is an innovation studio, which is the, the innovation arm of a larger company called Apolis. And uh, we help basically clients reinvent themselves with uh, bledge technology, you know, leading bledge technology such as artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, IoT, blockchain, but also lately uh, 3D and uh, augmented reality. Um, so you can check our website here. And we started this webcast, um, you know, early this year, last month. We invited um, um, Eve from Corto AI to talk about uh, you know, storytelling and, uh, and artificial intelligence. And, and this is really in the context of, of innovation. So we're gonna have this monthly uh, webcast where we invited different panelists to really discuss about the experience. And, um, and the whole idea is really um, inviting people that are actually pushing the boundaries of, of innovations that are you know, um, bringing together, they like to bring together people from different disciplines to really think innovation differently. And that's, that's what we're interested in uh, at Kinestry. Um, so um, we wanna make sure that the conversation doesn't stop uh, with the webcast. And that's the reason why we just uh, recently, the last uh, 24 hours decided to actually create a, um, a group on LinkedIn, a group on LinkedIn called Innovation Augmented. And um, all the panelists will be active participants and moderators of, of, this, um, of this group. And so I invite you, first of all, to join uh, this, uh, this uh, LinkedIn group. Um, so you can see that Jay will uh, share the, the link uh, to this LinkedIn group. And really, you know, um, uh, try to, uh, uh, to participate as much as you can uh, on the conversation uh, around innovation. Um, so once again, uh, we'll... Um, we'll um, we want to make sure that the conversation keeps going beyond the webcast uh, today. So having said that, um, I would like to, uh, to introduce Safir uh, Velali, which is uh, uh, um, our guest, uh, client, uh, friend, uh, partner in crime and innovation uh, today for the webcast. Um, I'm going to introduce him. I need to read because he has such an impressive bio. So I want to make sure I don't miss anything. So I, I prepared uh, a, a very short introduction just to, to present uh, Safir, and then we'll go in, in basically um, um, a, a conversation with Safir about his experience uh, in innovation and, 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 and his, experience, his experience with, uh, with the app. So um, Safir is, uh, is supporting today uh, the digital transformation initiative of the VF Corporation, uh, which is uh, you know, a, big, a big group uh, in, the, in the field of apparel footwear and accessories. And they have brands such as Vans, The North Face, Timberland, Dickies, but also most recently a brand I love, which is uh, Supreme. Um, he, you know, as the head of innovation for Vans, he oversaw a number of initiatives that span across products and experiences. He's an Aspen Institute First Movers Fellow, uh, heads up the 3D Retail Coalition's Education Committee, and teaches uh, design innovation at the Art Center College of Design, as well as at the U.S.'s uh, Yovine and Young Academy, which was founded by you know, Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine. 
Uh, he sits on the board of uh, advisors of several startups and he's working on two stealth projects uh, involving an experimental educational program for the underprivileged, as well as an autonomous living technology. He's an advocate of purposeful and responsible design and Safi believes that today's designer and innovators have an incredible opportunity to harness their collective creativity and today's technological affordances to tackle the world's social and humanitarian challenges. So this is Safir, and that's the reason why I'm so interested with his background to, to have um, you know, him uh, today in the webcast. So, you know, good morning, Safir. Good morning, Eric. Merci. Thanks for the, the kind introduction. Sure. Um, Safir, so I'd like to uh, start this conversation with um, a first question, which relates to your very unusual background, because you You've uh, you studied uh, and you graduated in mechanical engineering, so really it's just a super rational you know brain, and then after that you decided to um, to study design and you graduated uh, in industrial design at the Art Center College of Design. So design on one end, you know a lot of creativity, and the other end this very you know engineering background. So how do you connect the two, and you know how does it reflect in your work? Uh, thanks, Eric. First, first off. Um, you know, allow me to to thank you for allowing me to to share my my experience today. Um, I'm I'm really grateful for the opportunities I've had throughout my, my career to um, to work with and learn from amazing people. And um, so I hope my my journey can help inspire others. So th thank you so much for that. Um, so for those who don't know me, um, I was born in Morocco uh, to a father to a Moroccan father. Uh, and to a German mother, and we uh, we moved to uh, to Europe to Luxembourg specifically uh, when I turned six. Um, but throughout my life, I've always found myself in between cultures, in between in that space in between. And I think this is a notion that you'll hear me talk about um, quite quite often throughout uh, throughout this um, this conversation. Um, I found myself. Um, you know, in between the German culture, European culture, and the Moroccan Arabic culture, which you know are pretty different. If you are, uh, you know, if if you can uh, think about the the implications of uh, um, of those two two roots, if you want, um, I also found myself in that space in between. You know, from an educational background point of view, uh, you mentioned the scientific uh, background with a mechanical engineering degree. Uh, and that creative, uh, creative side uh, with design. This was kind of part of a, a master plan. I, I knew that I wanted to uh, to become an industrial designer. I had a passion for for car design, and so uh, my parents really uh, made me aware of the the importance of having a um, a technical background before you uh, you went before I went into design. So I was I was really grateful for that, and it really shaped. Um, who I became and how I approached a lot of the, um, you know, the work and the, the, the opportunities that were presented to me. Um, I have to say it's been, um, you know, it's been a continuous learning experience. And if you can imagine, you know, finding yourself in that space in between, you can imagine the, the internal conversations um, that I've been having for, um, you know, for, for all my life, really, um, you know, between the, the, those two sides of, of my brain, be, between the, the two, basically the two sides of my, my personality. But I think, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's been really important for me to understand the importance of, um, of the idea that um, thinking differently really um, involves placing yourself in that space, in that space uh, between. And I think it was, a, for me, a humbling moment. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a humbling experience, if you want, but, um, you know, finding out that, you know what, I would not be the most talented designer out there. And, you know, I would probably not be the, the best engineer out there, um, but I could really bring value in that gap in between the two. Yeah, and, and I really love this idea of the space in between. And, and we also talk about, you know, that, that, that forces to create, you know, very unexpected collisions of ideas and, and perspectives and, and, and representations of the world that really feed into innovation. Um, so can you, I mean, uh, so you, 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 you graduated from, from the School of Design and then your first experience was actually in the, in the automotive industry. Um, and can you tell me more about that experience? Because you, you arrived right at the time where the whole industry was, was in the midst of a, of a big transformation. 
Yeah, so I came to the US to, to study industrial design uh, with a focus on automotive design, uh, which is the program that, that really, you know, Art Center is, is uh, well known for across, across the world. Um, and I have to admit, I witnessed that transition between analog and digital while I was at Art Center. You know, that, that whole creation process was, was happening. It had started obviously before, but we really felt it as we were moving throughout the, um, you know, the, the, the educational program at, at Art Center. Um, so, um, you know, when, when, I, uh, when I graduated from Art Center, I, I joined a classmate of mine and, and uh, you know, we were working with automotive design studios, supporting them with 3D modeling and, and rapid prototyping and also um, product design. Um, uh, uh, product companies in the in the toy industry and, uh, and et cetera. Um, but what was really interesting through that that timeline here, you see, um, this is not me, but it's a you know it's a it's a student arts uh, arts center student uh, working on the clay model. That was a process that um, as we were going through arts center shifted to uh, working more using digital tools um, and specifically your prior creation tools where you you would still sketch you know we'd, you would still sketch on, on pen and paper or on photoshop things like that but you would translate your your work into 3d this is very old by the way so apologies for the you know this is back in, in the in 2000 but um but what I learned through that process is that it's, it's um, you know, despite that unavoidable, unavoidable shift to digital, it's important to find the balance between analog and digital. You know, digital is not there to replace all the work um, that, that, that you do as a, as a designer, as a creator, but it's important to be able to, to go back and forth. And, and again, you know, it's that balance between right brain and left brain, uh, developing that, that tactile emotion relationship with the product that you're designing, with the thing you're designing, you know, being able to um, touch the surfaces, to, to really make, you know, um, make changes, understand reflections, things, things that you can't, you can't always uh, do in a, in a computer on a screen. Mm. And then you moved, I mean, you, you, you spent years in, in, in the car industry and then, then you moved to VF. And, and VF is a, is a footwear and apparel industry, uh, it's an apparel company. So, um, you know, curious to hear what's, what's the link between your background, what you were doing in the automotive industry and what led you to go to VF and what was the connection there? Um, so the interesting thing is that when I, when I joined Vance, um, I joined Vance not through the footwear or the apparel, um, you know, categories, product categories, but through the hard goods. Um, and I, I joined um, the action sports equipment uh, group designing protective gear for action sports. And action sports was my, my second passion right next to, uh, to automotive. So when I was presented with the opportunity to, um, you know, spend half of my time designing uh, uh, protective gear and, and uh, you know, technical product for action sports and the other half testing it, um, I, <laughs> I couldn't say no. Um, but, but this is where the, um, the engineering uh, side comes in because you know, we were designing um, product protective gear that um, had very specific functional expectations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was something, you know, the, uh, those were hard goods that were, um, for the most part, injection molded or, or vacuum formed. Um, and so there was a component of sculpting, there was a component of um, structure, structural engineering, uh, impact testing, understanding the, the physics and um, the ergonomics. So this is really, um, this is really something that, um, you know, I felt very comfortable in and I was able to to bring in a lot of my, um, you know, the tools that I was using on the automotive side, I was, uh, I had the opportunity to, to bring them into the workflow design here, that, that kind of product. Um, this last slide that you, um, that you just uh, flashed there was, um, you know, a, a happy, uh, happy opportunity that we had as a, as a Vans design team to, to partner with Fiat. Uh, so this is where my, my background in automotive design came back. This is, um, this is not too long ago. Perfect, yeah. um, we, we had the opportunity to, to partner with them and create a, a, a car specifically for the NL auto show. And that was a concept car? Or that was it was a concept a car, yeah. It was a concept car. Yeah, it was a concept yeah, car. Yeah, cool. So, um, so now that you were at BF, okay, and you were working at the time for, for Vance, um, 
can you tell me more about how you started integrating some of the, the digital tools that you were using in the automotive industry? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, um, on the equipment side, um, I really had the opportunity to continue using the, the tools that were already part of my workflow. You know, uh, I would use um, Avis Auto Studio um, to shape and, and sculpt the, the surfaces because a lot of those were uh, were quite organic and, and quite, you know, there was an element of, of um, form development um, there. Um, and also, you know, SolidWorks for because we were actually delivering tooling ready CAD files. And this was um, quite um, a big change from the way things were, were done before, where we were actually um, taking ownership and keeping control over the outcome of the, the manufacturing process. And we, uh, we wanted to, to make sure that the, the files that we were submitting uh, were really those that, that were um, uh, that were the ones that, that were going to be used. Um, but this, you know, the, the important thing to, to understand is that, you know, in the automotive industry, in the, in the hard good industry, you actually have to create the CAD to be able to manufacture the product, yeah. right? Especially when you're talking about injection molding, a lot of, uh, you know, um, additive manufacturing, um, you know, right now. You, you have to, you need those, those 3D files. It was not the case for footwear and apparel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it was always creating 3D assets was always an afterthought. Um, however, what was unique about Vans is that a, a large portion of the business was based on uh, five key classic silhouettes, you know, and a multitude of materializations. Um, That's what so, we're looking at right now. Yes, exactly. The, so okay. if you go back, if you go back to the previous slide, I think you um, it, it kind of shows how um, how exactly uh, these are the, the the five key silhouettes that um, that really define um, mm -hmm. you know the, the the classic van styles. Um, and it was interesting because we came to the realization that once you have built the the geometry, you've built you know the the the, the product. Um, you could then uh, materialize it and apply different materials and visualize uh, what those materials would look like. And so we, uh, we went in, we started uh, the first virtualization pilot um, in about 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the aim there was to create a digital twin to each one of these uh, five, five silhouettes. Um, and instead of building it from, from scratch natively in 3D, what we did is we scanned uh, what we call the hero sample. I was going to be representative of, of that specific silhouette. And we, um, we rebuilt that in, in 3D. And so we had, we, we essentially, uh, you know, built a chassis um, for, for uh, what we were gonna use later on, uh, you know, yeah. for different colorways, for different applications, materializations, et cetera. And is it that that led you to the big idea? Yes. Um, <laughs> so the oh, big idea, idea. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, once we, we kind of understood the power of visualization um, and using 3D assets, photorealistic 3D assets um, and photorealistic materials, we started thinking about, um, you know, the, the brand's commitment to creative self expression. And we started thinking um, about what this would mean. Um, what it would mean if we put the tools of creation into the hands of, of the consumer. So that conversation uh, with the uh, e-commerce team and with, uh, with uh, the, the business started um, kind of you know, uh, growing and we ended up pitching um, what we call the Vans Customs 2.0 platform um, to the VF Innovation Fund. And um, we, we were granted um, the, the budget and um, the green light to, to move forward with that. Um, however, one of the things we, we really, and that led obviously to the, to the deployment of, of mm. this uh, customization platform uh, that is still, you know, um, yeah. you know, very, very active and very successful today. Um, one of the things though that we, we realized is that um, this whole interactive experience, so the, what was innovative about this experience because Vans had a customs, uh, customs program before. It was based on um, a technology that was proven, you know, it was Adobe Scene 7. Uh, it was proven, it was used by pretty much everyone in the, um, you know, in the industry, mm -hmm. but it was not interactive. 
And so what we wanted to push is this idea of photorealistic interactive uh, creation, uh, co-creation with, with, uh, with the consumer. Um, but the biggest challenge for us was that the, the technology that would power this experience, which was the WebGL technology, uh, was not mature at that time. You know, mm -hmm. there were some examples um, on the automotive side that we, um, that we had identified that were kind of getting us there, but you know, we, we had to really make a decision uh, at that point uh, to either go the safe route and then use mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the technology that we had been used in, in the past, which was you know, not really gonna move the dial very much, or if we, we were gonna push the boundaries and, um, and really um, you know, invest in this WebGL yeah. technology. Mm -hmm. And I remember we talked about that when we were preparing for the interview. And uh, there's something you know very, that, that we discussed. And I'm very curious for you know for you to share that. But um, I mean, obviously there was some tension between you know the, the business uh, of Vans and the innovation team, and and, and kind of um, in a justified way because you know the business it was is is a, is a thriving business. It's been working very well for for so many years in in, in its form. Um, and you were, you know, bringing all of a sudden a new technology and we're trying to push the boundaries of, of you know, of, of this technology into the business. And um, I imagine there's been this tension because, you know, there's, there was an imperative uh, to preserve, uh, you know, what was working already. So how did you, can you share with us how you, you overcome this, this, this tension? Yeah, of course. Um, so the tension you mentioned, you know, at that point we were, uh, I was still, um, you know, inside inside the company, I hadn't transitioned to, um, out of out of uh, out of the, the company. Um, but that that tension, I think, is a natural is a natural tension that needs to exist between uh, you know between innovation and and the business. Um, this is something where um, we we recognize that there's um, there's an opportunity to to innovate, but at the same time, you know, this was not just a marketing or a, you know, an experiment. Uh, this was this was actually um, a um, you know a, a a business that needed to be to be protected that needed to uh, you know to be you know, to be grown. And um, it was um, I think it, in, in retrospect, it's it's a uh, it, it's a healthy um, it's a healthy tension that needs to exist um, anytime you you talk about innovation. You know, it, you. Um, Mm -hmm. um, if, if you think about innovation, um, innovation projects that that are not pressure tested and that that are not kept in check by by the the constraints of the business, you know, you uh, you could find yourself in a in a situation where you cannot, you know, you're you're um, uh, evolving in a space that, that you can't control. Mm -hmm. um, so the way we we went after this is really, um, it was a, a very um, extremely collaborative uh, effort where we, and, and um, I would also say a very uh, pragmatic effort where we really looked to understand, okay, is this technology um, viable or not? And is this something that, you know, is, is the risk, the level of risk acceptable? Mm -hmm. So we went back and as I mentioned before, we looked at what the on, uh, automotive industry was doing because at that point they were um, leading the, the field in, in, um, in customization and con configuration um, on um, in a in a browser, right? So we we partnered with um, with a company that called RTT, uh, which become became 3D Excite, uh, right. now owned by Dassault System. And I, I see uh, Parker Fredland is on the is on the call. He was he was my partner in crime there, um, um, and we um, we worked to um, to validate this this WebGL. Um, this WebGL technology, understanding what the limitations are, what the, the conditions for, for it to operate, mm -hmm. because um, the challenge for us was to make sure that this experience works across platforms. It was not just, you know, in a very controlled environment, you know, we were going to open this up to, to the public. And so it needed to work even on, on phones. You know, I think we went back to the iPhone 5 at that point. It needed to be, to be compatible. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, luckily, you know, obviously there were a number of conversations about the, the, the risks and, and the, the appetite for, for risk. Uh, and, uh, but ultimately, you know, the, the Vans team agreed to, to bet on this technology and, and we built the platform from, from the ground up. Um, and so for me, the lesson, as I mentioned before, is that, um, you know, that, that, that 
tension, um, that natural tension that exists um, between all the, the parties when you're trying something new, when you're pushing something that is that has not been done before um, is is healthy and, and I think very, very important. Yeah, creative tension, huh? that's really- uh, Creative tension, yeah. That's really, yeah. Um, something else, you know, that's we're always interesting in uh, when we work with our clients on innovation and, uh, you know, the thing that we um, we always um, advise against for the clients is to say don't don't um, don't take the technology and try to figure out what you can do with this. Okay, um, um, it's you, you don't build something because the technology is here and you have to work with that. And um, and and what I'm showing this image here is because you know with the custom platform that uh, that was released in 2016, I guess. Um, I mean, you guys are you're doing a double digit growth every year, which is really impressive. It's one of the most advanced platform in terms of customization and really deliver to this um, idea of the the batch of one you know being able to have like completely personalized shoe made, uh, made out of your own creativity which is pretty amazing and that really speaks to and i took that that, that image that really speaks to the brand uh, um, of heritage of van which is the of the world and when it started you know the, at the very beginning in this shop where you know uh, you were you could pick your canvas and, and comes the next day to pick pick up your shoe so my question to you, uh, Safir, what what led this initiative? Was it did you did you start with this idea of, of the what if we could extend the, the brand heritage? Did you start first with playing with the technology and then this idea pop up in in, in your head? Yeah. First off, uh, I want to mention I take no credit for the for the success of the the Vans customization platform because this is work that the the brand has. Uh, put in a lot of effort after we after we launched it. You know, it's it's one thing to create the platform, right? But it's it's another thing to really, um, you know, um, uh, make sure to integrate it into the the, the brand storytelling. Make sure you fuel it with meaningful mm. uh, activations and things like that. And and so um, I'm you know from from the outside now I'm I'm looking at the amazing work that uh, that the team uh, has been doing over the the past four or five years, and it's. Um, it's been really um, inspiring and and, uh, and impressive to to see what what they've done with it. You know, it's uh, uh, that's that's something I wanted to mention. Um, but fundamentally, when, when we think about you know what we call what we call the big idea, uh, is that it was a logical progression of our virtualization effort. Right? It was as I explained before. Uh, we recognized that the power of of uh, uh, photorealistic uh, visualization and interactive. Um, you know, customization, um, and um, and so it was. You know, there was definitely a, a, a technology component. You know, an unlock mm -hmm. uh, there. Um, but I think what made this really meaningful and compelling was that this um, this idea was built on one of the pillars of the brand heritage. Um, and which was customization. You know, back in, in 1966, you could cut, you could go into the van store in Anaheim and um, you know uh, bring your your uh, your fabric. Your um, okay. Yeah, your fabric, yeah. and then drop it off, and then pick it up the, the next day, and pick, yeah. pick up your 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 custom shoes the, the next day. I think it was a third of a yard of of, mm. of material, um, and you you get your um, your product uh, back the next day. That, that's at the, the core of the, the heritage of the brand. This is something we wanted to amplify. This is something we wanted to celebrate. Um, so, um, so starting from that, because that needed to be the, the starting point, um, we were able to think about, okay, what um, technology, what, what, how can we bring this experience into today's, today's world and, um, you know, how can we leverage technology um, to to really uh, augment and and uh, and supercharge the, this mm -hmm. experience? Um, so you know, and it it just so happened that at that point uh, the technology was coming to the visualization technology was coming to maturity, um, and it provided a way for the brand to fulfill uh, its commitment to creative self self expression. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Ultimately, you know, the technology, uh, the, this 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 pro this platform empowered the custom to use the product as a canvas, and the technology enabled uh, that experience. And and so from there, I mean, we consider 
the, the custom platform, you know, as, as a success, but at the same time, it was like a prototype, uh, you know, for VF. It was like the, the first successful product that you were launching and scaling with. Um, um, what I'm interested now to go is uh, what sparked the idea for, for your teams as you, you were moving actually to VF at the time. Uh, but what's part of the idea from, from taking this success and then trying to uh, push the boundaries again and try to apply the digitalization to the, to the entire production process? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, as that visualization technology evolved, um, what we really saw an opportunity to expand um, this, uh, the application and uh, the, the, the benefits of, of these technologies to other brands and other product categories. So, you know, at, at that point, you know, we were looking at uh, the North Face, Timberland, uh, Lee and Wrangler at first, um, but ultimately, um, you know, here, this is an example of one of the very first examples of, yeah. um, of visualizing a, uh, uh, a, a, a 3D, um, a 3D asset, and and um, you know what's what's important. This this shows at what uh, to what level the visualization technology had had progressed, had evolved, um, and and got us to a point where you, you you could not tell whether this was a photo of a of a product or a render. Um, and so um, ultimately, uh, and, you know, ultimately, when you think about it, there was an opportunity. Um, for us to leverage the, these technologies, uh, knowing that we had uh, the, cap the the ability uh, to create true digital twins, you know, and create these artifacts, these these objects that represent a physical object, but um, you know, in a digital digital fashion, uh, you know, one to one, you know, that that there, there should not be daylight in between mm. uh, the the representation, the, the actual product and its representation. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we found out that we had an opportunity to, um, to communicate um, to the brands that we could create better, better product by being closer to the market, um, unlocking new products and experiences across brands and, and categories, and ultimately also um, do business in a much more responsible way. You know, it was never about taking away uh, samples. It was never about, you know, compressing the, the time of forcing designers and, and um, developers and product teams um, to, mm. to create more in less time. It was not about that. It was about uh, making sound decisions, optimizing the use of physical samples, right? Um, and reducing our, our footprint as an organization, mm -hmm. because we know that a lot of these samples, these, these, these uh, um, production samples, development samples, sales samples, um, represent a lot of the, the footprint yeah. um, of an organization. Um, it, it was just about you know, doing things much more responsibly and ultimately delivering a better product for, yeah. for the consumer. And um, just to uh, illustrate where you're talking about here, what are we looking uh, on the picture? Is that is like a real model versus the virtual model? Or is it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you're That's asking, it, I imagine that it's yeah. it's kind of hard. I think you can you know you can tell it by by looking at the the the, the, the body form. Um, mm. You can tell that um, you know this this shows you this was done you know let's say maybe five six years ago, okay. um, and it gives you an idea of of how close you can get really. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so um, I'd like to uh, now move to um, to going back to a conversation about about um, your project innovation and technology. And what I'm interested in is to understand um, what's your process within the innovation team of identifying which technology you want you want to adopt and you want to scale with your organization. Have you are you are you following a playbook uh, to do that? What's What's the approach to, uh, to to that? And I'm saying this because there's so many emerging technologies every day, and there's so many different directions we can be pulled uh, in. So curious to hear your your approach. So my my answer to that is um, yes, there's probably a playbook, but um, there are obviously things that that I can't share and things that that understandably um, uh, I can discuss. But in general, one of the there are a few things um, that I can. Uh, that I can mention. And this goes back to the conversation about that space in between. Mm. Um, I think what, I, what I've learned um, in general is that it is important 
to keep an eye on the adjacent spaces, right? If you're in a specific industry, you can just look at that at that industry in a you know in a vacuum. Um, and so for for the the fashion space, um, you know, we're looking at gaming, we're looking at VFX, we're looking at what's being done in automotive because there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn in that space in between is um, has the ability to inform you on you know on opportunities to develop certain capabilities to adopt uh, or adapt certain certain tools etc um also understand that technologies change very fast you know it's it's mm -hmm. very it's dangerous to over invest in a tool because you know according to Moore's law um you know you might that specific tool might be replaced by by an app in about 18 months you know, mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things we've we've learned, and, and this is something that I that I share with uh, with my students, um, is that it's it's more important to show the ability to learn fast, rather than the sh than show that you're really really good at one uh, at using one one specific tool. And it's so, interesting because as as designer, if you've been to Arts and College of Design, that they have always had the, the T approach. So okay, so you, you go deep, you know, with one mm -hmm. tool. Actually, but then at the same time you go wide in terms of horizons, right? To to to, to interest, you know, spark interest in other fields. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, can you speak to that? Do you mean that today it's about um, getting to the right point of understanding the tools and then trying to actually spend more time in in exploring other possibilities? Is that what you recommend? Yeah. So you have to be good at what you do. You know, there's no there's no going going around that. And you have to master your tools. What's, what's really interesting is that the tools that are available today are much easier to adopt um, and to learn than they were even five, 10 years ago, right? Um, and so um, you have the ability to quickly learn a tool um, and to, uh, to perfect the, the, your, your use of, of, of uh, the specific tool, this platform, et cetera. Um, and ultimately be able to decide which ones you need to, to use, which mm -hmm. ones you need to adopt to mm -hmm. get you to the final result. You know, it's not, it's not about, um, you know, just staying at a superficial uh, level on, on a multi multitude of, of tools. You, you need to know exactly what, uh, which ones will take you to, will get you to the, the end result. Okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that, um, is the importance uh, of prototyping. You know, prototyping is, is absolutely cr crucial, um, and and you know, in the spirit of human-centered design and, and design thinking, you know, there is that iterative process that is important. Uh, so evaluate, create, uh, create an, an MVP mm -hmm. um, to test and learn, and then build on that, and then repeat, uh, repeat on that. This is something that it's a fundamental uh, approach that I think is drives uh, still drives uh, the activities no matter what happens with the technology. Yeah. Thanks, Safir. So I have a couple of more questions before we open this to a, to a, to rest of the group, and that's um, that relates to uh, where we discussed and we're preparing about the future. Okay, um, so this is the future of the work as, as designer, and I'd be curious to hear from you. Um, you know how these new technologies, emerging technology, that's actually has been you know been accelerating in terms of sophistication since last year with the covid but how this is is affecting the work uh, of, of the designer that's my, my first question yeah so i can't really predict uh, where things are going to go because things change so fast i mean you know think about where we were a year ago uh, and where we thought uh, the, the the future would take us um but what i'm seeing is a shift there's a definitely a definite shift um for the, the designers specifically um mm -hmm. as i just mentioned digital tools are becoming more and more intuitive um and these digital tools actually are starting to be designed to adapt to the workflow of these these designers instead of the other yeah. way around you know i think this is a, this is an important one because you know, in the past, you had these really complicated uh, software packages that required, you know, weeks and weeks of training. And, you know, the, 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 the designer had to, um, you know, shape their understanding and their, their approach to, um, to match uh, the way the, the software is programmed. But now um, these tools actually are, you know, they, they understand the workflow and they adapt to that, that workflow. So that's, um, that's, a, big, uh, that's a big shift. 
What, what are we seeing here? So this is um, this is something that uh, you know the the current uh, product creation tools for on the apparel side uh, are offering, and I think this is a good example of um, the way these tools are actually augmenting the um, mm. the, the the capacity of the, the designers, the ability of the designers to make great um, good. Uh, decisions early in the process. You know, this is this is showing um, tension maps and then pressure maps. And so mm -hmm. you have the ability to understand whether a, a specific pattern, this is very specific to, to a parallel, you see, um, mm -hmm. how that's going to fit on a certain body form. And you have the ability to visualize that in, in real time and make changes accordingly instead of having to, um, you know, to create new patterns, drape them yeah. and, and have them uh, wear tested. And this is representative of um, of something that I think is important to point out, you know, the tools that we use don't really change or replace the work designers have to do, you know, but instead they're, they're augmented, you know, they're augmented and they, they give, they empower the, the designer to, to, to make better, better decisions. Um, we're also uh, seeing uh, for the consumer specifically um, that the work the designers are, are doing um, is evolving from designing one product at a time. So designing a, a great graphic, for instance, if we yep. take the, the graphic design approach, um, you know, designing one great object, one, one great item to designing a platform that can uh, generate a multitude of possibilities where the consumer is engaged in interactive co-creation experiences. So this and is that's an what we're seeing here. Yeah, this yeah. is an example of an app that, that I love, by, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it really puts, again, the, 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 the tools of creation in the hands of the individual. And you can, yeah. you know, it, with, um, in playing with very simple parameters, you have the ability uh, to create these amazing, these, these amazing um, uh, you know, graphic uh, creations. Um, and and it's, it's fun and it's, you know, everyone can create. And, uh, and I think this is, this is really important. So fundamentally, as, as soon as you digitalize the, 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 proce uh, the process of product creation, you unlock a multitude of new visualization cap capabilities, um, but also you know, the use of AI, computational design and additive manufacturing applications really unlock new, new possibilities. So we see, we're seeing what, uh, a few examples of what uh, generative design can, can do for, for functional yeah. Uh, product design in this case this is um you know the, the work that um one of my designers henry song uh, did during one of the timberland events where uh, with with a few team members um they they really took uh, a digital representation of, of the shoe they created um a, a digital model and basically experimented with different uh different tools and different uh, pipelines uh, and ultimately uh, 3D printed this. So it's, yeah. it's interesting how you can start exploring different spaces, um, yeah. you know, once you have these, these digital artifacts. Uh, that's where AI has become so interesting in, in as, a, as, a, as a tool to actually, uh, you know, innovate in design optimal um, performance shoes. Um, you know, we've seen this, we've seen this with, in, the, in the car and in the uh, industry, but that being applied also now in, in the, in the uh, shoe uh, man, uh, shoe uh, industry, uh, and that's the team, and that's the one that uh, you've uh, you you guys worked on as a as a prototype. Yeah, it was just it was a happy accident. It was a really an experimental uh, project, but it uh, it was uh, it was very very interesting. Yeah. So last question for you, um, as we conclude the, the, this conversation. Um, so we talked about the future of the designer. Uh, what uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'm very curious to hear from you is. Is and again, I engage your opinion. But where do you think the uh, apparel industry is going? What's the future? How how is it evolving? So I wish I had a, a crystal ball. Um, but what what I think I'm I'm seeing happening is that uh, well, first of all, uh, let's take a step back. I think we have to remind ourselves that product design and innovation doesn't exist in a vacuum anymore. Right. Um, it, it really exists in the context of an end to end experience, the way the consumer actually experiences the brand, experiences the product. It's not just about the product itself and, and the you know, brands in general understand that. Mm -hmm. What I'm seeing, though, is that there's a really interesting um, 
convergence of two domains, which is the fashion space and the gaming space. This is one that that is really um, really interesting. And if you see the the growth of the um, of the the fashion, uh, sorry, the the gaming uh, industry um, and and some of these these gaming franchises like Fortnite, for instance, um, who yeah. uh, generated, I think, in twenty nineteen, one point eight billion dollars in in game purchases. You know, this is absolutely yeah. uh, staggering, especially if you think that these assets that are being sold are are digital. They're purely digital. They don't exist. Mm. There's no tangible. Um, there's no tangible. Um, you know, element to them. Um, so, and also the the rise of NFTs, non non fungible tokens. Um, in this world where uh, your your artists and, and creators are are, are creating. Uh, artifacts and products that are going to be only digital, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's uh, that's really interesting. The boundaries between these domains are, are disappearing, um, and we're also seeing parallel economies emerging in the metaverse, um, where there's a need for fashion, right? You you have an yeah. avatar representing you. That that avatar needs to look good, you know. And, and I'll pause um, that for a second just to clarify for the for mm-hmm. for the participants who doesn't know about metaverse, but the 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 metaverse is the next evolution of the internet, where it's actually creating these these environment, which is a complete virtual environment in which our double identity will have a second life. You know, we had we had the stories of second lives 15 years ago that you know there was a lot of excitement behind, and then you know the the, the maturity on the market was not there, the attention was behind. But it looks like it's 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 there. It's going there. I mean, we heard Fortnite, who um, you know uh, announced last year that they are. They want, they want to turn the gaming engine into a metaverse, you know, eventually. So we're using the, mm-hmm. the power of the gaming engine to actually create this new internet where, where we, have, um, we, have, we have a second life in it. So just wanted to uh, clarify that. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting is that, you know, this is obviously a um, very recent collaboration that the North Face uh, and Gucci uh, did with uh, Pokemon Go. Um, but if you think about it, this, um, this idea of digital fashion is fueled by digital creation. You know, if you don't have those digital uh, asset creation pipelines established, mm-hmm. there's no way you can you can even enter that, that this whole world, right? And you were talking about uh, Second Life. Um, you know, Sansar is is basically uh, the evolution of of Second Life. It's it's gone through yeah. ups and downs, but um, you know, it's a great representation of a social uh, platform that has its own marketplace. Uh, you can choose your avatar, you can choose who's going to represent you, you can shape their face, their body, etc., to either resemble you or not at all. You can, you can dress them uh, the way you want and you can, um, you can send them out and, and uh, you know, into, the, into environments and have them interact with, with people. So I think this, mm-hmm. is, this is to me one of the most fascinating developments in the, in the past few years. Thank you, Safir. Um, one last question before we open to the, the forums. I want to make sure we give enough time for people to ask questions. Um, uh, can you um, can you give me give us if, if you have one piece of advice to give to innovation teams? Uh, what would be that advice? So going back to this idea of of the space in between, I think this is this is obviously a personal learning, but I think it applies applies across the board. Um, what I've learned through this through this journey um, is that you will not find big ideas in the defined swim lane. You know, mm. uh, so it's important to be comfortable exploring uh, places that you don't know, and, and places that are kind of um, you know adjacent um, and and a little bit in, in in between known known places. This is where the the opportunities are. So, um, you know, it's important you know to empower your team members. Um, to explore these adjacencies and the space in between. Um, it's important to feel comfortable doing that. And, and you know, the reason is, is because that's where, in my opinion, the, the true opportunities can be found for innovation. Great. Thanks, Safir. So we'll open the, um, thanks so much uh, for, for this conversation today. Um, so we'll open the, the forum to, to the participants if any question. Uh, again, uh, you can you can still you know if you don't have the time now you can still post a question on the on the group uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, Jay is gonna uh, post the link again here. Um, so yes, let's see. I see a few people are asking questions during the, the 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 chat. So let's look at what we have here. 
Um, okay, we have first question. At what stage in the design process do discussions of scale up, physical manufacturing, material sourcing, et cetera, come into play? And how do you see this, the in-between intersection space as having an impact on the infrastructure pipeline of the apparel industry? Well, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I think ultimately investing in this digital transformation will allow organizations to be a lot more efficient, you know, allow, allow them to be closer to the market, better understand what the consumers actually need and better understand uh, how to respond to those needs. Because, you know, the, the, the past uh, process, which would take 18, 18 months to bring a product to, to the market is not, is not really working anymore these days. So um, when you think about that, when you think about allowing factories um, to focus on production um, and allow the whole supply chain to really focus on production and not necessarily on, on sampling, which is disruptive to the whole process, um, I think you start looking at um, a win-win situation for everyone. You know, the consumers get what they want. The, the manufacturing partners can focus on activities that truly generate, uh, you know, profit for them. Um, and then the, the brands know that they're, they're doing a great job because they're, they're being conscious and they're being responsible um, in, in how they, uh, they operate, but they're also uh, ultimately serving the, the consumer the way, the way they should be served. Okay, thanks. Another question here, uh, how do you keep up to date with technologies that are constantly evolving? So we kind of covered that point, but anything else you wanna add here? So that's, um, that's a good question. I think um, there's multiple ways, ways to do it, but I think it's important to, um, to again, keep an eye on the horizon. You know, stay, stay curious, stay hungry, as, as Steve Jobs would, would say. Um, and, um, you know, make sure you, uh, you continuously uh, stay up to date um, up on, on what's happening in these, in these uh, adjacent industries. Um, and, and, you know, know that you are, you never, you never know everything, you know, you're never in, in control of, of, uh, of, the, of a specific topic or a specific theme. Um, and you're always in, um, in, in the learning mode. Mm. I have another very interesting question I heard many times from clients, actually, technology can move fast and new tech is very pricey. How do you go about justifying ROI and how do you know when to pull the trigger on the new investment? <laughs> yeah, that's probably the most, the most um, challenging uh, question of all because you know, we've all faced this. You know, should, should we invest in the, in, the, in the new phone knowing that there's a new one that's gonna come, come out next year and, and uh, you know, things are probably gonna be cheaper. Although uh, for mobile devices, it doesn't really happen that way. But um, that ultimately, this is a conversation that needs to be owned um, by, by the, the technology teams, by the brands. Every organization has a different appetite for the, this kind of stuff. Um, and know that there's no, especially with digital technologies, even those who are late to adopt may have an advantage because you know, the, the new tools that are available are probably cheaper, probably easier to implement. Um, and so, um, there's no real advantage um, to having been there for, for a while. What's really important is to stay agile. I think agility is, mm. is the, the most important thing. And then when you think about investments, um, you know, it's finding the right balance between building the, the, the foundational infrastructure for this transformation to happen, but um, being open to uh, interchanging uh, specific tools. Uh, mm -hmm. So understanding the, the commonalities uh, and the foundation and, and making sure that you're, you're not um, pigeonholing yourself into one, one type of workflow. Another question from Ivan here, which I just was looking up, up, up in the chat, which such great tools available and so much great results from your point of view, what is impending the industry to move onwards? I mean, I, th I think it's the, the need to stay relevant and, and the need to, uh, to continuously adapt to the, to the market. I mean, you know, look at what, what um, the COVID uh, pandemic did to, uh, uh, to the industry. 
you know it was it was imperative not just from an operational point of view but also from a um, consumer connectivity uh, point of view to um, adopt digital uh, processes and, and really accelerate the adoption of, of digital processes um, and so I think you know where where digital product creation used to be a, a nice to have uh, I think we're, we're learning that right now it's a matter of, of survival if, if, if you really think about it you know pandemic mm-hmm. or not no pandemic you know um, these things are going to come and go but fundamentally I think this um, this situation really um, accelerated the understanding uh, that you know we need to 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 give ourselves the agility and the flexibility to adapt to the to the changing environment mm. Um, talking about environments, I'm going to take one last question here, so I want to make sure we finish on time. Can you speak to the positive environmental impact? Yeah, this is a good, uh, this is a great one. This is an, an important point because one of the ways we, um, we have been able to justify uh, the investments and, and uh, the importance of this, this transformation is also um, in, in, you know, in communicating um, the the impact, you know, that we're having on on operations and on the way we are we um, we bring product to the market, you know, um, you know, it's not about it, it's not about saving physical samples. It's not about you know reducing the the um, the calendar, but um, ultimately, uh, it's about being more efficient. Right, mm-hmm. um, and when you think about the uh, the impact that creating physical samples uh, throughout the devel- development process, you know, having them shipped back and forth between the the, the, the manufacturing partners in, in Asia or around the world, um, and um, and uh, you know, having all the sales samples, for instance, um, being created and um, and you know shipped around the world, physical samples. If you can replace that with virtual digital samples. Um, the impact is is tremendous. The cost yeah. implications yeah. Are, are, are tremendous. The um you know the, the footprint, the carbon footprint is is, is tremendous. Yeah. But so it's 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 a it's an amazing it's an amazing uh, collateral benefit. Sophia, thank you so much. It just reminds me that uh, you know we could lead to another conversation about a circular economy, which would be interesting in, in your industry uh, in in particular. But might be another webcast yeah. the next time. Uh, well, thank you so much. I would like to thank all the participants again for, for being with us today. The conversation is not over. Uh, please, if you have any other questions, we're going to actually post the one that's still left in the chat. We're going to post them on the group. Join us and join us to the next the webcast that we're going to post in a couple of weeks. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, it was exciting uh, for me to, to be with you uh, today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me.